Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds this Thursday morning. I'm Avakadi Wada, one of the chief medicine residents this academic year. It's my pleasure this morning to introduce our very own Dr. Hilary Reno. Dr. Reno is the Associate Professor of Medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases here at Washington University in St. Louis. Her research interests are to improve the quality of care for patients with sexually transmitted diseases. She serves as the medical director of the St. Louis County Sexual Health Clinic and the St. Louis STI HIV Prevention Training Center. In addition, she serves as the medical consultant for the CDC Division of STD Prevention. She joins us this morning to discuss the 2021 CDC STI treatment guidelines and how to meet challenges in sexual health care. Thank you, Dr. Reno. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us. I uh, here, let's see. Here are my disclosures. And the talk today is going to be really divided into three sections. Uh, we are going to cover some basic information about STI epidemiology. Um, but we're really going to quickly get into talking about the treatment guidelines, um, really focusing on the management of gonorrhea and chlamydia and recent changes that have been published in the MMWR. Then we're going to the third, uh, the last third of the talk, really kind of focus on how uh, we can conceptualize the challenges in sexual health care and uh, what we need to uh, uh, correct the issues that we discuss right now. So uh, STIs in the United States, uh, even before the pandemic, were at concerning rates. We have seen since 2014 increases in gonorrhea and syphilis, especially um, 63, 71% uh, rate increases in each of these. And we're really at the level of STI um, rates that we saw in the early 1990s, including with congenital syphilis, which has rapidly increased uh, since 2014. In 2018, there were 1,300 cases of congenital syphilis in the US. And the 2019 data, though delayed by the pandemic, will be released next Tuesday. And I can tell you that uh, we approached 1,900 cases of congenital syphilis in 2019. This is very concerning. Each of these cases is really a failure of the public health system. Um, and as our rates uh, continue to increase, um, we were still faced with challenges from the pandemic, like most of uh, medical care. Though it appeared initially that rates were falling, that's really an artifact. Um, we were challenged by um, obvious uh, issues like not having test kits uh, because of production uh, delays due to COVID test production. Most of our contact tracers uh, and the um, uh, ability to um, uh, work cases of especially syphilis and HIV was hindered because uh, those patients, those people were pulled and deployed into uh, working uh, on the COVID pandemic. And so there was an artificial drop in STI rates. At the same time, we were seeing the impact in decreased testing, decreased people seeking health care, like many um, uh, uh, people have been concerned about when it comes to management of chronic diseases and diagnosis of uh, MIs and cancer, for example. But the impact of STIs remains, and they've done some work on the current 2020 data uh, showing that the rates of uh, at least gonorrhea have continued to increase uh, despite this increase in testing that we saw. And so the impact of STIs isn't going away. Uh, STIs are uh, largely diagnosed in our youth. So the, these are conditions um, that impact our young people. They cost a lot of money um, and they're very, very common. In addition, um, you see impressive uh, disparities uh, in STI rates. These, this is a map uh, courtesy of Andrew Torgerson, an epidemiologist with the County Health Department that shows you the distribution of uh, gonorrhea rates um, over the entirety of St. Louis County. 
this data is from 2017, um, but you can see that there's quite a concentration uh, of gonorrhea uh, in the northern parts of the county. And in fact, when you look at the rates of gonorrhea among Black and African Americans, it's almost 20 times the rate that we see in uh, white county citizens. And of course, this goes back to uh, the racism that we see in our society, that, how that impacts healthcare, the quality of the healthcare. Um, and we're gonna come back to this uh, in the last third of the talk. But this kind of gives you a taste of some of the challenges that we see in sexual health um, from stigma, uh, health disparities and racism, to the syndemics and overlap of substance use disorder, HIV, hepatitis, and STIs, which of course are further impacted uh, by the stigma and racism associated with all of these conditions. And then on top of that, we had the impact of the COVID pandemic on our ability to deliver healthcare and testing and treatment. And certainly the pandemic has shown us uh, that public health uh, has been devalued and defunded and uh, politicalized as well, that hinders our ability to deliver good care. All of this is set in the environment of rising STI rates and uh, the added concern of antimicrobial resistance. As an example of stigma, I wanted to show this campaign from the New York City Health Department. So you can see these, this is a campaign they had um, uh, started a couple of years ago to increase uh, the um, uh, usage of their STI clinics. And you can see that, you know, this campaign, it's funny, it's um, timely using um, uh, little emoticons um, and really spells out exactly what they're encouraging people to do, saying that you can enjoy your sex life and stay healthy by getting tested for STIs today. So to get tested at a sexual health clinic, call these numbers, right? So I wanna contra uh, contrast this with the um, St. Louis campaign for encouraging people to get tested. Um, so it is indeed titled Get Tested, STL. Um, this ran on Metro buses, was in posters at, met, at uh, bus stops, um, and this is the entirety of the campaign. So it's a website. You aren't quite sure what they're asking you to get tested for, right? I mean, especially now, if these old posters are up, you'll see the, people will be wondering if that's COVID testing. Um, but this was uh, targeted to STI and HIV testing. You can see that it 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 can't even put the word sex in its advertising. And so um, that's a real hindrance in engaging people uh, to healthcare. So next week is National STD Awareness Week. Um, what is that going to mean? Well, we do, like I said, get the surveillance report released uh, on Tuesday. Unfortunately, the treatment guidelines um, are not ready for release, and we had hoped they would be by this point. Um, but the uh, delays of the uh, effect of the pandemic um, have been pretty severe on the treatment guidelines. Um, so you'll probably see some press articles uh, on STI rates, um, and uh, the AP uh, just came out with one yesterday. Um, but uh, the STD Awareness Week will be hindered a bit by us not having the treatment guidelines out yet. So what about the treatment guidelines? Um, it's a question that I've been asked about um, every day pretty much since the summer of 2019 uh, when the expert panel met and uh, we were able to um, spend uh, three days together. It was a really um, one of the last times uh, we were all together in person. Um, the written draft uh, and interagency clearance steps have been um, delayed with the pandemic response. It is expected to be published in MMWR probably at the end of the summer at this point. Um, and there was a public webinar in December, as well as the release of the gonorrhea treatment guidelines in MMWR in December uh, that we can at least uh, talk about uh, this morning. And clearly I can't cover all of the treatment guidelines uh, in even an hour talk. Um, this year, 2021 version is over 500 pages long. Um, there will be an app that will boil that down to um, easily use, utilizable tables uh, that will be released with the guidelines, which is great. And we are looking towards um, moving these guidelines uh, online with more frequent targeted updates um, uh, that uh, would be more, more easily evolved with the literature. So 
a few things that the treatment guidelines can do to tackle some of the challenges in sexual health. And one of those is stigma. The beginning of the treatment guidelines um, is really focused on prevention. So we're gonna go a little bit into that, but you'll notice that we've changed STD to STI. Uh, though the uh, CDC division of STD prevention remains STD prevention, um, we are moving our language to STI. Why is that? Uh, it turns out that the word infection is less stigmatizing uh, than the word disease. It also reflects the fact that 70% of STIs are without symptoms um, and therefore uh, infection is more accurate. But there has been some uh, work, especially with adolescents that shows that STIs um, is found to be uh, less stigmatizing. So the treatment guidelines uh, consist, like I said, of the prevention um, introductions, sections which uh, where changes there can really impact care and reduce stigma and sexual health. And then it is followed by um, all the treatment recommendations uh, on each of the STI conditions. So if we kind of focus on pr the prevention section first, um, the 2021 guidelines will uh, talk uh, about the latest in counseling, um, screening and vaccination recommendations. And uh, one thing that is uh, uh, stigma reducing and can help reduce disparities is that it will discuss the utility of expedited partner therapy for cisgender men who have sex with cisgender men. And you may wonder, well, what, what's the impact of that? Um, previously, uh, uh, MSM have really, there's not been a lot of evidence that showed that expedited partner therapy benefits them. And so it's not been recommended. Um, and they've been, ex, you know, essentially excluded from uh, expedited partner therapy programs um, and procedures uh, in many places. And so this kind of, this opens that up um, to all the patients that we see in our sexual health clinics. We'll also be, uh, have a new section on multipurpose prevention technologies. Um, you know, condoms are a multipurpose prevention technology, meaning that that they uh, serve as pregnancy prevention, but also as STI and HIV prevention. But there's other um, technologies that have uh, emerged and are being tested, including rings that can deliver uh, PrEP, um, as well as birth control um, and other uh, modalities to uh, deliver uh, pregnancy prevention alongside HIV and STI prevention. There's also expanded sections on uh, some of the special populations that we focus on, uh, including, uh, of course, uh, cisgender men who have sex with cisgender men, and then a really wonderful section on transgender and gender diverse persons that um, uh, I worked with uh, with Dr. Asa Radix from um, Cal and Lord on uh, that will really raise the profile um, of uh, transgender and gender diverse persons for whom um, healthcare has often been a trauma. And so um, uh, making sure that uh, the general population of clinicians who read the treatment guidelines get uh, more accurate and complete information uh, is a very good purpose for the treatment guidelines. There's also um, uh, updates and changes to the uh, traditional taking of sexual history in sexual health. This has been um, uh, termed the five P's, uh, and those five P's, the language of those have changed. Uh, in addition to the um, brief mention of them in the treatment guidelines, the toolkit um, available on the CDC website on how to take a sexual history has also uh, been rewritten. Um, it is uh, something I've worked on for three years, and I'm just really glad it's finally going to uh, see the light of day. But um, some of the examples of how the five P's have changed um, is the that traditional, do you have sex with men, women, or both is very outdated language and not gender affirming. And so that question has been changed. Um, it's um, uh, very simple to ask, what is the gender of your partners or potentially have a nice open-ended question, but you know, tell me about your sexual partners uh, to begin a conversation uh, on getting someone's sexual history. Um, practices, uh, not only speaks about the type of sex that someone's hap, uh, having, but also uh, it helps knowing that information helps to promote appropriate testing so that extra genital testing for STIs does, does occur in clinical settings. I just saw a patient um, in STI clinic who's living with HIV, sees a, a provider uh, outside the St. Louis region and had never been tested for gonorrhea, chlamydia, let alone had a pharyngeal or rectal swab performed. Um, and so uh, by asking people to talk about and uh, to discuss uh, sexual practices with 
patients while again obtaining a sexual history, we need to encourage that extra genital testing that's so essential. Um, We'll also still be assessing past history of STIs and promoting more frequent testing where indicated. Uh, we'll talk about protection, but it's not just condoms. I mean, if condoms were going to fix our STI problem, that already would have happened. So we need to talk about other forms of protection, including um, uh, testing, treatment, uh, PrEP and PEP uh, as well. And then um, we'll be, we have moved the discussion on what was pregnancy prevention to something termed pregnancy preferences. So it involves much more patient-centered language. So this is a very important change in the prevention section of the treatment guidelines. Additionally, there were some themes that came up at the treatment guidelines meeting, including antimicrobial stewardship, uh, the concern for my, of my plasma genitalium, um, and some new clinical evidence in the management uh, of other STIs. So let's talk about gonorrhea. There was an MMWR report that was issued uh, in the middle of December of 2020, and uh, it has uh, changed our treatment for GC. So this is uh, how it started and how it's going. Uh, we've moved away from dual therapy into a higher dose of ceftriaxone. So here's the MMWR report, if you wanna go look it up. Um, I've summarized the main points here, and we're really only gonna talk about um, those things that are bolded. Uh, but the recommend, recommended treatment for GC uh, has evolved to 500 milligrams IM of ceftriaxone times one, and this is for uncomplicated gonorrhea. Uh, for patients that uh, are, uh, weigh over 150 kilograms, a gram of ceftriaxone is fine. And for anyone who works in the ED, if the patient has an IV, the pharmacokinetics of IM and IV ceftriaxone are close enough that this can be delivered as an IV dose and uh, there's no need to also give them an IM injection. Um, just use the same dose recommendations. Uh, the if Chlamydial infection has not been excluded. Doxycycline, 100 milligrams twice a day for seven days is now recommended. So this is actually the part of this MMWR report that caused the most, con most um, concern. Uh, and our consult lines have not stopped um, binging <laughs> since this was released, uh, but put a pin in that for a minute. We're gonna come back and talk about uh, chlamydial management. Um, so the guidelines, the, the MMWR report, the guidelines really uh, lay out the uh, clinical and published evidence for increasing the ceftriaxone dose and ending dual coverage uh, with azithromycin. Uh, so we're gonna talk about, uh, really focus on that this morning. Um, first, also, if you go to the report, you will find this box, which summarizes uh, all the important points so that you can have that easily accessible. But I'd like to point out a few things. If ceftriaxone is not available, which was um, a concern uh, during the pandemic with very strict stay-at-home orders such as uh, we saw in New York City, um, but is also a concern for patients who have a true allergy to um, cephalosporins, gentamicin plus two grams of azithromycin is the alternative therapy. There is a high failure rate with this, um, up to 80% failure rate for uh, pharyngeal gonorrhea and 85% for rectal gonorrhea. And so patients deserve a test to cure two weeks after this treatment. Um, the other alternative therapy of ceftriaxone is not available is cefixime, 800 milligrams. It used to be cefixime, 400 milligrams, but that's gone up to uh, 800 milligrams as an oral dose. I use this very rarely when people cannot have access uh, to ceftriaxone because of uh, the uh, difficulty with the suffixime has penetrating the oropharynx. Uh, we had a patient who um, presented on a late Friday afternoon was with uh, gonorrhea, was uncomfortable. It was a holiday weekend. They were not able to get uh, IM ceftriaxone. And so uh, we prescribed uh, suffixime 800 milligrams, um, knowing that otherwise they would have been uncomfortable for the whole weekend. So that is an example, but really uh, ceftriaxone is much preferred. Uh, as it is quite successful at treating gonorrhea at all sites. So why were these recommendations changed? Well, first of all, uh, for overall improved antimicrobial stewardship, uh, but also for pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic considerations that we have better uh, information on now when it comes to ceftriaxone treatment of GC. And then we're also seeing, unfortunately, changes in the azithromycin susceptibility and gonorrhea uh, over the last few years. So first of all, gonorrhea is one of the top five organisms recognized um, as an urgent threat when it comes to antimicrobial resistance. Um, 
And so we'll talk about the azithromycin resistance rates we're seeing there, but we're also seeing increasing azithromycin resistance um, in Mycoplasma genitalium, uh, which is a highly resistant organism and of great concern because uh, we'll get to the management of that in a minute, but um, it is challenging. We're also seeing azithromycin resistance increase in other organisms, including strep pneumonia, um, which can be a cause of severe pneumonia, uh, Shigella campylobacter, and then just the general, general impact to the microbiome um, because azithromycin was no longer adding anything uh, when it came to the management of gonorrhea. Uh, that is why we have moved away from dual therapy uh, at this time. So we know that gonorrhea is a highly resistant organism. This is a wonderful timeline that shows um, as every antibiotic has been brought out uh, historically in the light gray boxes above the timeline. Uh, resistance uh, has subsequently followed, uh, as you can see in the darker gray boxes below the timeline, um, including uh, most recently um, and within my time of practice, fluoroquinolones. So Cipro resistance. Um, uh, meant that we had to change, the ch guidelines were changed in uh, 2017, I mean, sorry, 20, uh, 2007, in order to uh, really remove um, one of the most common and um, uh, preferred oral treatments for GC. So gonorrhea has proven that it's going to continue to beat us and challenge us. Um, what we know is that obviously, if, like with all antibiotics and organisms, as uh, ceftriaxone has to stay above the minimum inhibitory concentration long enough to kill the bacteria uh, and affect a cure. And luckily, in recent years, we've had better modeling and mouse model research that has shown us that this really is a 20 to 24 hour period um, and that is better achieved with a 500 milligram dose than with a 250 milligram dose. And so this is the reason that that dose has increased now uh, to 500 milligrams. We also are really concerned about uh, the difficulty of uh, curing pharyngeal gonorrhea. Uh, that is likely where the resistant strains are acquiring um, genetic material from other surrounding bacteria to become resistant. And so um, this dose uh, does a better job uh, in the oropharynx than the 250 milligram dose does. And so lastly, um, Azithromycin resistance in GC has been noted to be increasing, especially from 2014 uh, onward. This data from the Gonococcal Isolation Surveillance Project uh, goes through 2018, and you can see the rates have increased uh, of resistance have increased to almost 5%. Uh, we did have 2019 data presented at a conference late last year. Uh, azithromycin resistance had increased again to 4.9%. What was really interesting, though, is the Cipro resistance, um, which had been sort of level at 15, 20% in gonorrhea, gonorrhea strains, had increased to 35%. Um, when we haven't used Cipro to treat gonorrhea since 2007. And in fact, it was thought that perhaps if we had a, um, a genetic testing that would enable us to see if a GC was susceptible to Cipro, that it would be useful um, in clinical settings to be able to use Cipro at times. But with this increase um, of Cipro resistance to 35%, it raised a lot of questions about the utility of that sort of testing. Um, and the other question it raised was why in the world did Cipro resistance go up in GC when we're not using Cipro? Um, and I think the answer to that is actually obvious. Um, and that is the uh, community pressure of uh, community-based antimicrobial prescribing on gonorrhea strains. And so Cipro is certainly an antibiotic um, that is used quite a bit for other infections. You're Urinary tract infections, for example. Um, and so uh, that, that um, community-based uh, population pressure against GC to, to have resistance to um, antibiotics that uh, are in the community certainly persists and has driven, no doubt driven, uh, this rate increase as well. So those are the reasons why the gonorrhea um, treatment recommendations have changed. Uh, so let's talk about its application a little more broadly, because when this came out in mid-December, it doesn't mean that people stop getting uh, uh, complicated gonorrhea. The MMWR report only talked about the management of uncomplicated gonorrhea. And so in cases in which there's complicated uh, gonorrhea presentations, how does that influence the uh, treatment dose of ceftriaxone that would be prescribed. So here's a case I saw um, 
uh, a few months ago in STI clinic, where a 28-year-old uh, cisgender man came to clinic uh, with dysuria for three days and noted pain in the genital area while lifting at work. Uh, this was actually scrotal pain. So he, had, he uh, has sex with cisgender women and reports using external condoms about 10% of the time and never with oral sex. So obviously there's a lot of opportunities uh, for prevention counseling here, um, but uh, the important part was his exam, which showed uh, copious white urethral discharge, um, as well as an inflamed urethral mucosa. Um, he had a swollen and tender right testicle uh, that was really, um, the pain was uh, focused where the epididymis uh, is located. And the gram stain uh, showed as an example here, you can see uh, amongst all the white cells, you can see intracellular gram negative uh, diplococcus consistent with gonorrhea. So just a side note, some of you are wondering what in the world is gram stain, right? So gram stain is this really old, wonderful thing um, uh, that allows us to see uh, gonorrhea on um, largely urethral uh, uh, slides, but uh, can be used on in endocervical um, samples as well, though the, we use that less so. Um, but it's very sensitive and specific um, for uh, GC, uh, for patients that are symptomatic and have discharge. Um, and so it saves, it, before it was saving us a lot of treatment of GC um, because we were able to do a uh, gram stain to determine if it was present or not. So for this patient, uh, he clearly has gonorrhea. This is not straightforward gonorrhea gonococcal urethritis because he has inflammation um, of his epididymis and uh, potentially uh, orchitis as well. Um, and so how do you apply these, this MMWR report to the management um, of a more complicated GC? Well, since we understand why the ceftriaxone dose was increased and why we've moved away from dual therapy, if GC is a possible etiology, um, we are at a point now where treatment with 500 milligrams of ceftriaxone uh, should be prescribed um, and would be recommended. So for example, uh, in the case of a victim of sexual assault for whom would be receiving empiric coverage for many STIs, uh, they should be given 500 milligrams of ceftriaxone with either doxycycline or azithromycin for chlamydia coverage, as well as metronidazole for trick coverage, and then consideration of PEP and bicillin uh, based on the exposure and local rates of HIV and syphilis. For epididymitis as, ex as a shown an example with this patient, um, I gave him 500 milligrams of ceftriaxone IM and uh, 14 days of doxycycline, 100 milligrams twice a day to complete his course of ep uh, for epididymitis. PID recommendations, um, we just to tell you the treatment guidelines will contain a stronger recommendations for the inclusion of um, metronidazole, um, which most of the people I know have always um, included metronidazole in management of PID, but um, this has uh, stronger evidence. Uh, there's been a published um, clinical trials that have shown that a uh, higher cure rates uh, with the combination of ceftriaxone, doxycycline, and metronidazole. And again, that ceftriaxone dose, if it's an outpatient dose, should be 500 milligrams, right? Okay, so where does this leave us with gonorrhea? We've talked about how resistant um, gonorrhea is, how it can quickly become um, and develop resistance to new drugs, um, but there are new drugs in the pipeline. Uh, there are three that are, at least the top two are in phase three studies um, and have shown uh, promise. They're also being developed for other infectious diseases, um, but alongside that are being tested uh, against GC as well and have shown success. Um, and then there's um, uh, another investigational drug uh, listed at the bottom that um, was developed in England that they are testing there as well, but is in much earlier trials. Uh, so we do have some potential oral agents um, that are uh, in development and close to uh, getting closer and closer to approval. Okay, so let's go back to that pen um, and talk about the management of chlamydia. So chlamydia is a much more common cause of urethritis and cervicitis than gonorrhea is. And we, we see um, really up to 15%, if not more of our patients presenting to STI clinic have chlamydia. Um, it also can lead to proctitis um, via uh, lymphogranuloma venarium strains and uh, non-lymphogranuloma venarium strains. It also can cause uh, pharyngitis, though it's 
really thought to be a transient infection, um, but and can also cause conjunctivitis. So what do we do with chlamydia? Now that we have seen that the treatment recommendations will prefer doxycycline over azithromycin. Well, let's do discuss this in the context of a case. So a uh, 24-year-old cisgender man with HIV on antiretrovirals, well-controlled, um, viral load is undetectable, um, reports and comes to clinic for routine follow-up where um, amongst other things, a sexual history is obtained uh, and the patient reports two cisgender male partners with receptive oral and anal sex and insertive oral sex and uses condoms often. Uh, otherwise, uh, their exam review of systems uh, is unremarkable. So routine testing is done, which would include syphilis serology uh, and uh, three site testing for gonorrhea and chlamydia via a nucleic acid amplification test. So a pharyngeal swab is obtained, a urethral or urine swab, side note, um, uh, urine and urethral samples from um, uh, people with a penis are equally sensitive and specific. So a urethral swab does not have to be done. A urine sample can be obtained. Um, and then a rectal swab. And the L, the labs come back normal, except the uh, rectal uh, NAT test shows chlamydia. So how are you going to treat this patient? So if we look at the 2015 treatment guidelines, you will see recommended regimens and alternative regimens. The recommended regimen show that azithromycin a gram orally or doxycycline for seven days were equally recommended. And then the alternative regimens you can see that includes erythromycin, which really no one can tolerate. The GI side effects are, um, are, are uh, suffer, uh, not sufferable. Um, and then levo, uh, levofloxacin uh, is you know, certainly expensive, um, but uh, was listed as an alternative regimen. So the language of our guidelines is purposeful. When a recommended treatment is made, it is a treatment that is more effective as has been shown by evidence in observational studies or randomized controlled trials. Of course, we prefer randomized controlled trials. An alternative treatment would be effective, but less so, or effectively less so, is if it is more difficult to take or to tolerate. So this language is very important. And what we will see in the 2021 treatment guidelines is a shift in the treatment uh, for chlamydia, that the recommended treatment will be doxycycline 100 milligrams twice a day for seven days. This is because of evidence and observational studies I'm gonna show you, and now a randomized controlled trial that shows that doxycycline is more effective in eliminating chlamydial infection, especially true with rectal infection, but is also true uh, in your genital infection as well. Azithromycin, that lovely one gram, one time dose, is an alternative treatment for chlamydia. It is less effective than doxycycline, uh, but it has its own advantages. And so azithromycin was and continues to be a treasured treatment because it can be dispensed easily in the emergency department or a clinic um, and patients don't need to fill prescriptions. Even if they have to fill a prescription, it's a one-time dose. So hiding medications from people, uh, your guardians, for example, isn't an issue. It's safe in pregnancy. It is easier to take if someone's housing is unstable or they have other challenges in their lives. Um, it was thought to be cheaper, though I will tell you, if you look long enough, uh, you can find doxycycline monohydrate seven-day course that approximates the cost um, at a pharmacy for azithromycin. I will tell you the 340B pricing of azithromycin is less than the doxycycline prices. So for a clinic like mine who provides treatment um, for patients, um, our cost for doxy is higher than it is for azithromycin. But at least at pharmacies, um, if you're, if you're savvy and can call around, which of course is not really going to describe many patients um, that would have the time to do this, that you can find doxycycline uh, on an approximate cost to the azithromycin treatment. But it really comes down to what medication therapy is the most um, effective for treatment. Um, most treatment failures are reinfection. They don't reflect treatment failure. But we do know there's lower rates of cured extragenital sites when it comes to azithromycin. This is a list of 
um, observational studies. So this is not randomized controlled trials, um, but you can see that in those patients treated um, with doxycycline um, for rectal chlamydia, uh, the uh, percent positive at follow-up was less than you would find with azithromycin. There, uh, in addition, was just this release study um, from Julia, Julia Dombrowski at uh, University of Washington um, and Kath Meyer at um, uh, Fenway in Boston that uh, was a randomized controlled trial for um, doxycycline versus azithromycin and treatment of rectal chlamydia. So when they perform NAT tests two weeks after treatment, you will see that doxy in blue um, had uh, uh, cure rates of 94, 97%, depending on the population you were looking at, uh, whereas azithromycin um, was lower in the uh, 82 to 88%. And then at four weeks, there was a, a further divergence of success with doxycycline, um, depending on the population. If you look at attention to treat, 91% uh, cure, whereas azithromycin was 71%. Um, why is that? There's that difference at two and four weeks. Um, we'll talk about that. So why is doxycycline effective? Um, it would be easier for us to make our decisions if we kind of understood what was going on. Unfortunately, we don't have a great answer. Is it pharmacokinetics? Is it the fact that doxycycline has better tissue penetration, especially in the GI tract than azithromycin? Does it have something to do with the immune response? Um, is there heterotypic resistance within chlamydia? We really don't see resistance in chlamydia to azithromycin or other um, uh, antibiotics, but could there be um, some uh, heterotypic resistance within the chlamydia population uh, of a patient's uh, infection is with the higher um, load in rectal infections, could it be that some organisms aren't eradicated? That is one explanation that's being proposed for why um, the azithromycin cure rates dropped uh, from two to four weeks in that randomized controlled trial. But again, we don't have um, very strong evidence, just sort of theories. There's also um, some thought that uh, chlamydia be can be acquired orally and cause a persistent sequel infection um, as well with some asymptomatic uh, shedding there. So lots of, um, lots of good questions, no dis you know, discrete answers, um, which makes it harder to talk to patients about this. Um, so here is uh, sort of what I propose in management of chlamydia at this time. Um, it doesn't fit easily into a very simple treatment algorithm or table. Um, so we're, the, if you're seeing a patient who you suspect has chlamydia, um, their NAT test is pending, and that person could be pregnant. Clearly, azithromycin is indicated at that point, right? If that person could have rectal chlamydia, we have excellent evidence, randomized controlled trial, um, observational studies that show that doxycycline is much better at achieving cure. And so if they don't have a contraindication, doxycycline seven days uh, with 100 milligrams twice a day would be the re recommended therapy for chlamydia. For all other people, this really was where shared decision-making comes into play. Doxy is going to be preferred. It has at least a 3% more effective rate um, seen also in at least one other randomized control trial I didn't discuss for genital urinary infection. And so because of this, this question, a seven day course versus a one day course, the best thing to do is to actually talk to patients about what they would prefer giving them the evidence that doxycycline gives you a little bit of an edge in treating your chlamydia. Um, if it's rectal chlamydia, it gives you a big edge in treating your chlamydia, but certainly you can't ignore something, something is even 3% effective, but they have to balance that with their ability to um, obtain and take a medication for seven days versus one that's a one-time dose. And given that their side effects are very minimal, that's really not a consideration for patients. I put asterisks here because this is the part of the, of the diagram and the flow chart um, where our own biases about caring for patients can come into play. We might look at a patient and assume that they can't take seven days of antibiotics, but if implicit bias is part of that decision, 
then that can lead to under treatment of chlamydia in certain populations. So it's very important that we have this conversation with patients. I've done it a lot over the past three months. It's easy. Um, and patients will tell you what they can manage and what they can't manage. And it's important that we not underestimate them. Um, so this is something I've also been lecturing on um, for three months now. Um, and people have lots of questions about it. So we'll talk about um, uh, a place you can go to ask uh, consult questions to at the end of the talk. So if we come back to this idea of antimicrobial resistance, we've talked about gonorrhea. Just a side note, T. pallidum, the causative agent of syphilis, um, does have uh, concerns of resistance, but luckily not against penicillin. Um, but for example, um, azithromycin really cannot be used against T. pallidum. There are many places in the world where 100% of the T. pallidum is resistant to azithro. So we do have concerns about antimicrobial resistance and other STIs. But primarily our focus aside from gonorrhea is on mycoplasma genitalium. Um, so what is mycoplasma genitalium? Just a few short words um, on it. It is increasingly recognized as an important cause of urethritis. It probably also contributes to cervicitis, um, but there's really not a lot, a lot of strong data that shows that it's a causative agent of say pelvic inflammatory disease, for example. Um, but it definitely causes persistent urethritis. Um, Testing in the US has really been available until 2019, uh, but now there is NAT testing um, available. You, that is a, a send out here, uh, but it is available. Um, azithromycin has been the preferred treatment uh, for MGen, uh, but unfortunately it quickly induces macrolide resistance. Um, and so really the Australians have led the, um, uh, the uh, management of MGen um, by, and they are really achieving high rates of cure by first treating with doxycycline, a seven day course that reduces organismal burden. Even though most of MGen is resistant to doxy, it will still knock down the number of organisms that are there. And then they give a seven day course of moxifloxacin. So there is um, our test being developed to allow for resistance guidance, guided therapy uh, for MGen, which will be very helpful, um, especially as none of us in the public health field have really explored the availability of moxifloxacin and uh, what that's going to cost our programs. Um, it, in addition, the test, of course, is still pretty expensive. Um, but the goal would be as resistance guided therapy becomes available to test for mycoplasma at the time of initial presentation, and if positive to have a reflexive macrolide resistance test performed that would tell, you, uh, tell the clinician whether azithromycin or moxifloxacin would be the better treatment uh, for the patient's mycoplasma genitalium. So how common is MGen? Um, well, when it comes to urethritis, uh, we have uh, one good published study that was a multi-site um, uh, study that looked at men presenting with urethritis and found that um, all, almost 30% of them were positive for MGen, which was a similar rate they found for chlamydia and gonorrhea. Remember, these are, are um, were cisgender men presenting with um, uh, uh, persistent urethritis. So this was a special population. Um, TRIC was noted to be about 6%. Um, but for you know, organismal identification purposes, MGen was um, similarly prevalent as uh, chlamydia and gonorrhea. And unfortunately, 60% of the um, isolates had macrolide resistance, so azithromycin would not have been effective for these patients. So when we look at the treatment guidelines for 2021, it's still they still contain no recommendations for screening for MGen. Um, we are encouraging permissive testing for patients with urethritis um, and hoping for the availability of resistance guide, guided therapy to, um, uh, to help in treatment choices. Looking to that point, um, the treatment guidelines are likely to include the following uh, treatment recommendations that if resistance testing is not available to attempt seven days of doxycycline followed by seven days of moxifloxacin, if resistance guided testing is available, um, again, use, the use of the doxycycline to decrease or 
organismal burden, followed by either azithromycin for three days, uh, a, a total of three days with one gram on that first day, um, if the or if MGen is macrolide sensitive. If it's not, um, seven days of moxifloxacin. So you can see that um, the management of mycoplasma genitalium also does not yield itself very well to um, uh, protocols uh, or to uh, flow charts. And so um, this will be continue to be a complicated discussion that we have with clinicians. Because 50% of STIs are really diagnosed and managed in primary care, um, our audience and, um, uh, and the, the audience of clinicians that need to be educated about STIs is very broad. Um, and so though we have prevention training centers, uh, and I'll give you the contact uh, for ours here, um, we, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big audience to reach and explaining things um, like this or like shared decision-making um, can be very, um, very challenging. So let's just do a quick hit on a couple different topics uh, in the treatment guidelines for our main STIs, including syphilis um, and trick, uh, before we move to the uh, last bit of the uh, talk today. So um, syphilis is becoming more common. We're seeing atypical presentations, uh, condylomalata, uh, painful chancres, for example. No new data has emerged to warrant change in our treatment recommendations, uh, but the guidelines really move towards um, affirming and reassuring that a lack of drop in RPR titers um, needs to be followed out by time. And so you shouldn't necessarily expect someone's RPR titer after treatment to drop within a couple of months. You really need to give it 12 months and up to 24 months uh, in cases of syphilis of unknown duration. We also um, uh, suspect that there will be uh, a removal of the uh, recommendation to repeat a lumbar puncture at six months after treatment for patients that have recovered from neurosyphilis if they have no symptoms. So if their symptoms have resolved, um, then a lumbar puncture at six months has been shown to not add anything clinically to the management of that patient. Um, and so that repeat LP will no longer be performed. This has impact in the management of ophthalmologic and otic syphilis because lumbar puncture used to be recommended because of the reason of needing to follow up to make sure that neurosyphilis, if it co-occurred with ophthalmonotic syphilis, um, was being managed correctly. But because if a patient has no other neuro neurologic symptoms, um, with presentation of ophthoaotic syphilis, that lumbar puncture um, is uh, less needed uh, than uh, it has been proposed in previous guidelines. Uh, and so many of these patients will not have to undergo a lumbar puncture um, if they have isolated um, uh, syphilis of the eye or an ear. Trichomonas, um, we, there was a randomized controlled trial that came out in uh, 2019 um, that showed that seven, a seven day course of metronidazole, 500 milligrams twice a day, was more effective uh, in achieving cure than the one, uh, two gram one time dose of metronidazole. So for patients with a vagina, the, because of this randomized controlled trial, it's recommended that trichomonas be treated with a seven day course. Um, there's still gonna be failure rates uh, of about 10%, uh, even with a seven day course of metronidazole. For patients with a penis, we're still recommending that two gram one-time dose uh, of metronidazole or if someone's a contact because we don't have evidence otherwise that it's more effective than a two gram one-time dose. So let's talk about, um, move into talking about the challenges and how we can meet them with opportunities um, that we have in sexual health care right now. So first of all, we are in an environment because of the pandemic where public health is at least has some recognition of its importance now. Um, there has also been movement on the national scale to uh, examine the issues we're having with STI rates uh, with some reports I'll show you. Um, and then there's also some increased funding availability uh, from in the epidemic uh, funding uh, to affect change uh, in sexual health care. We also have the availability of innovative care models like express testing and um, soon to be available, if not already approved, point of care testing uh, for gonorrhea, chlamydia at least, uh, that can really change how we manage patients. Um, and then the pandemic has shown us 
the the really the uh, benefit of cooperating uh, when it comes to public health challenges. So first of all, let me I can refer you to these reports that um, have been issued recently, the National Strategic Plan for STIs and the um, National Academy report on STI infections. Um, the National Academy report is 700 pages and the STI strategic plan, <laughs> plan is also very long. Um, if you want the uh, uh, shortened version of the National Academy's report, uh, let me know, I can email it to you. Um, but this, this represents uh, national attention that we've really not seen uh, in STI management um, uh, to help us. But this is how I frame our strategies for moving forward now, um, based on kind of what we talked about at the beginning of the talk and uh, what, what I believe is essential um, for uh, improvement in sexual health care outcomes. And that is first that we need our efforts to focus on anti-racist uh, work um, and really de, you know, build, breaking down those um, racist structures within medicine um, and within healthcare itself um, that also need to be uh, anti-stigma uh, in their efforts as well. We need expert care. Um, so this expert care doesn't just mean that it, these that clinicians are knowledgeable on how to manage STIs, but also that the care that they give is trauma informed and culturally respectful, that it addresses disparities, um, that is welcoming, again, absent of stigma, I can't say that enough, um, and also sex positive in its approach. Um, this can involve this innovative um, management uh, clinic, of clinical services like I've talked about with express visits and point of care testing and vaccine development and new drugs, uh, but also needs to be paired with increased public health resources, cooperation, and what I feel very strongly about regional data sharing. So I just wanna briefly talk about some of the regional resources we have from our prevention training center to our STI um, regional response coalition to the fact that the city of St. Louis Department of Health has been funded for three years to really listen to the community um, and affect change uh, in STI rates for black men. The community approach uh, based approaches to reducing ST STDs, STIs um, funded by the CDC will allow the city to build community um, uh, advisory boards and listen to patients um, about their sexual health in ways that we've never been able to do before. And then of course, Fast Track Cities, um, which joins St. Louis in an international effort to reduce um, HIV. So these regional resources are being augmented um, uh, by additional funding. So there was funding from in the epidemics um, directed at STI clinics. Uh, this component C funding was awarded to seven clinics in the country, one of which is the St. Louis County Sexual Health, uh, Health Clinic, located in North Central Community Health Center up in Pine Lawn, which is where I've practiced um, and been medical director of for 13 years. This is um, uh, a really um, a great clinic, high volume. We see a lot of patients um, certainly impacted by the pandemic and we are trying to recover from that. Um, but we are looking towards the building of a regional sexual health data infrastructure that is funded by this component C funding that will from the perspective of the health departments and other caregivers for uh, STIs, um, help unify um, our data sharing and uh, allow us to ask and answer questions when it comes to sexual health. So um, Paul Sorensen of the Regional Data Alliance um, uh, at OMSOL has, uh, you know, develop the schematic of what shared um, data looks like regionally. And so for sexual health, this means, you know, collecting data on testing and treatment management, um, making sure that is secured um, and governed by um, data, um, uh, data governance rules so that it allows really for real time surveillance. When the data comes out next week, the surveillance data nationally from 2019, we're halfway through 2021, right? So how can we, how can that data be useful to us, um, especially on a re regional um, uh, standpoint to managing STIs? So some questions that we could potentially ask of this data, just as an example, um, is, is everyone who is eligible for PrEP uh, referred for PrEP at a clinic? And so that is something that this data can help inform. This is um, an example of uh, something that uh, I worked with with Ann Trollard at the Institute for Public Health on. This is um, really just out. So we're lucky enough we had um, 
We knew about the testing sites in the St. Louis region before the pandemic, um, and we were able to survey all of them, both in April and November of last year, and determine which ones had closed, modified their hours, and then Anne was able to build a public dashboard on Tableau that allows um, our regional partners, whether that's an FQHC or a county health department, to be able to go to this data and look and see where their, first of all, where their clinic stands um, amongst the regional partners, but also to see if maybe they want to partner up. Maybe they've had to modify their hours because of the pandemic um, and, or because of uh, the spacing required to see see patients and they want to partner with another clinic um, to make sure that patients in their their area are getting um, sexual health care and it's another example of the data it allows them to kind of compare the uh, compare their um, status of open being opened or having modified hours um, uh, across the region. And so it's this sort of um, data visualization uh, and data platforms that we hope to bring to sexual health care uh, with this federal funding uh, for five years uh, to build out uh, this as well as improve our sexual health clinic too. So lastly, um, here is our consult uh, website for the Prevention Training Center. So you can uh, send sign into this website give us any questions you may have about uh, STI management whether in real time a patient you're seeing right then or um, you know something more um, uh, philosophical uh, we'd be happy to uh, respond to that um, there's a lot of people that I work with and I've worked with for many years um, including uh, Anne of course but also stir um, the STI HIV prevention training center and the sexual health um, clinic staff um, that I'd like to thank. And lastly, as we can talk through a few questions, um, I just wanted to lead you, lead you with some reading recommendations. Um, so we all should probably be reading more. Uh, the first two books, um, there are uh, fiction books set um, amongst topics of sexual health. Medical apartheid, of course, is very important. It talks about the history of racism in medicine and, and men, as well as sex. Uh, racism and sexual health. And then Strange Bedfellows is a book solely on STIs um, written by a friend of mine uh, that just came out and is very entertaining. Um, so with that, thank you for listening and sticking with all of this information and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Reno, for going through all of that with us. Um, we have a couple minutes here for a few questions. Um, one attendee asks, um, in the case of doxycycline versus azithromycin efficacy and chlamydia, their experience has been that one gram of oral azithromycin can lead to nausea and emesis of the pills. Is yep. um, that, that, that person who's asking the question, they're wondering if their clinical experience is skewed or could that impact the efficacy? Yeah, it does. I mean, as long as a patient keeps the pills down for an hour, um, then you can assume, assume absorption. We have patients take it with food. Um, which helps uh, the side effect, but that is certainly a problem. Doxycycline comes with some nausea as well, um, but mainly we're, with doxy, we're worried about esophagitis and uh, photosensitivity. So patients need, probably should be taking doxy sitting up, making sure they're not taking it right before they go to sleep, for example, um, and then uh, using sunscreen uh, through the course of the antibiotics and a little bit after, um, but everybody should use sunscreen. Um, but the, uh, as if that is a thermicin experience is not unusual. Um, I will say that at STI clinic, we only have about two to three people a month um, that need retreatment um, uh, because they weren't able to tolerate the azithromycin, but it definitely happens. Got it. Um, another person asks, when treating gonococcal arthritis, do you use one gram or two grams of ceftriaxone? Are there other instances where two grams uh, should be used? Yeah, so I think um, most people are for disseminated gonococcal infection. Uh, one gram uh, of ceftriaxone a day while hospitalized is fine. Um, we have, uh, because of um, what I couldn't talk about, uh, we've had some clusters of DGI nationally, including Michigan, California. We've certainly, I've heard a lot, a lot of DGI cases here too. Um, if there's true osteo where you have um, uh, bone cultures positive, um, it's fine to use two grams of ceftriaxone. We don't have guidance either way. So um, it's kind of a guessing game because this is these are rare. Um, and so I think that, um, uh, I think one gram would probably be enough, but two grams is um, is fine as well. Um, and then uh, transition to uh, oral therapy for DGI is once the patient is clinically improved. When you're talking about 
uh, gonococcal osteo or endocarditis um, management. Uh, we're going to do a short course of IV and then movement to um, oral. But again, there's not any clinical, um, there's not any very much public guidance on that. Thank you. Um, and the last question here is thank you for showing us that tool at the end of the consult that can be placed virtually, essentially. Um, I wasn't aware of that tool. Do you find that is it like staffed during the business hours of the day if you wanted to ask a question live? Or is it something that you would expect a correspondent staff within, you know, a day or so? Yeah, we ask people to do um uh, to give us a time frame. Uh, sometimes it's a one time, one day turnaround, uh, but it is uh, biz business hours um, uh, only. You guys can always email me or um, I'm usually on email uh, if there's something really important um, that you want quicker turnaround time with. Um, those consults go to our, to your regional prevention training center. So here it'll go to myself um, and Joe Cheraby on occasion as well. And so um, you can also just email us, <laughs> but that way we get credit for answering the consults uh, when it goes through our CDC uh, website. That is very cool. Thank you so much for sharing all of that with us, Dr. Reno, this morning. Um, it was a great presentation. I know that these are going to be, uh, you know, we're going to be using these new guidelines. Uh, so thank you for reviewing all of that. Thanks for having me.